This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. The miners' strike was the most significant working class battle on the second half of the 20th century, yet it is under-recorded, under-analysed and under-commemorated. Why? Because it's an embarrassment to the mainstream of British society. The Tories engineered a conflict and lied to the British people. Cabinet papers released on January 2014 prove it. Spell it out. Le- the Labour leadership were partially culpable for the miners' defeat. Neil Kinnock's performance, even handed, condemned the miners' violence and that of the police, going on a junket to Russia and saying there is no hardship in the coal field in November 84. New Labour want to paint class struggle as something from another epoch, for historians who do not want to influence the present, at best. At worst, in Doncaster, Miliband's constituency, where the racist right expect to do well, miners' organisation and politics are an embarrassment to be painted over, so calls for a miners' gala in Doncaster this year were swept aside by the council. Think of the Durham gala, why isn't there one in Yorkshire? The TUC leadership were also culpable for the miners' defeat, so no effort by the TUC to commemorate the strike. That said, the current crop of trade union executives were young activists during the miners' strike, and some are interested in a low-key way. Hence, still the enemy within got donations of a few thousand pounds each from ten union executives. Very welcome, but a start rather than a serious effort to remember the strike. The miners' union no longer exists in a meaningful way. Two or three thousand working miners locked in conflict with Scargill. The media don't want to recall their role in the strike. It was too crude, too blatant, there were too many lies. The BBC reversed the footage at Orgreave. An accident, they say. That's just one example of a daily bias. For a contemporary review of that sort of bias, look at the media performance in the Scottish referendum. Because the miners' strike caused such a major fissure in British society, the few programmes there have been have attempted balance, in inverted commas, and as a result have been pretty unedifying. (coughs) The picket's point of view, the scab's point of view, the policeman's point of view. There's no analysis, no real understanding to be gained, just abstracted history. The BBC, though, has not commissioned a single programme on the strike for national TV. It's running scared of the Tories with charter renewal coming up. I'm told... No. It told still the enemy within that it had done too many anniversary programmes this year to consider the film. Many might... Have I got the right page? Yes. Many miners who were survivors wanted to move on. Many who were not survivors inartic- were inarticulate or cynical about the fight. The strike was under-recorded and under-analysed on the left also because of the sharp conflicts around the outcome of the strike. A swathe of books immediately after the strike appeared. All the left groups put out material, many Labour correspondents produced books. Ian McGregor published his memoirs. Some strikers and women against pit closures uh, members published diaries, collections of experiences and reminiscences. Lots of valuable material, but not analytical and sadly not widely read. Some former NUM national officers published useful books, but formed the perspective of sitting in the national office, not on the front line, or the pit level union box. Sorry, that should be from the perspective of sitting in the national office, not the front line or the pit level union box. We've got to proofread this as well as read it (laughs) simultaneously. Um, There have been some valuable books since. Schumer's Milne's The Enemy Within, detailing MI5's war on the miners and Scargill in particular. Marching to the Fault Line by David Henker and Francis Beckett uncovers some useful new material, but wraps it in a narrative taken uncritically from Paul Routledge of The Times, who put the miners' defeat down to Scargill's ineptitude above all else, a lack of judgment by the book's authors that has made some people refuse to make use of the new material they discovered. Mike Simon's striking back was an attempt to argue that the miners were right to strike and they could have won. It was produced for the 20th anniversary, a good little book but not much resonance. So why the film? Why now? 
There have been two films, Pride and Still the Enemy Within. Pride is a commercial film. Art has tried to handle the minor strike and the impact of Thatcher, Brastoff, Billy Elliot. Some denounce them as saccharine, but they actually raised issues and memories when nothing else in the popular media was doing so. Much of the grit was taken out. Uh, in the Billy Elliot film, there's no pr police brutality, really, on the order of the funders. It was there in the scripts and filmed. Pride is partly in that camp. camp. It's the pet project of a successful screenwriter, a story he had always wanted to tell. Quite brave because it was going into a potential black hole that marked the 20th and 30th anniversaries. The second film is Still the Enemy Within, a documentary initiated by Mike Simons, a journalist on Socialist Worker, during the miners' strike and produced in conjunction with the Bad Bonobo Film Company, young filmmakers barely born in 1985. So for them, why a film? Firstly, efforts to mark previous anniversaries have got little resonance on the left, in the unions or in wider society. Producing more books on the strike is a way of keeping the memory of the strike a minority interest. Secondly, a determination by the filmmakers not to let the victor write the history and to find a popular way of presenting the story of the miners' strike to a new audience. Thirdly, it was now or never. Key actors in the 84-85 miners' strike had died or were ill. They needed to be recorded. Fourthly, this was fuelled by the death of Thatcher and the celebrations of her death in some mining communities. The fact that we have a Tory-led government pushing through policies that Thatcher could not do, partly because of the resistance of the miners' strike. Young people had no idea of the story of the miners' strike. They knew it happened, they knew there was a visceral hatred of Thatcher, but few understood why. Still the enemy within is turning into a cultural phenomenon. It won the Audience Award at the Sheffield Documentary Festival, uh, a significant achievement. There were standout reviews everywhere from The Guardian to The Mail on Sunday, via Mark Commode on BBC, Socialist Worker and The Morning Star and Vice. The initial plan for 12 to 20 cinema screenings is now up to 91 before Christmas. All have been sellouts so far, many that have taken place generating demand for repeat screenings. This is before a round of community and college screenings which is being organised. Why the success? Firstly, it strikes a chord in the current climate of austerity. Secondly, the film gives voice to the unheard, ordinary working class people. No experts, no politicians, no spin, just real people. Three, the people interviewed, Arthur's Army, the women who ran the community support groups and the local strike supporters, are a breath of fresh air, articulate, passionate and intelligent, a big contrast to the official politics. They really are every man and every woman among those who took part in the strike. The film was fantastically received in former Welsh, Scottish and Yorkshire coalfields. Every claim made by the activists in the film is backed up by archive footage, making it a fantastically powerful document and leaving filmmakers in massive debt to pay for licensing. This material which was buried has effectively been liberated and put in the public domain by the film. It makes links between the Thatcher project and the state of Britain today, which makes a lot of sense to young people and makes them very angry and want to fight. Sixthly, the film doesn't rehash old arguments on the left from 30 years ago, but does insist the miners were right to strike and could have won. It is a jumping off point for debates on fighting back now. Pride and Still the Enemy Within struck a chord. They helped to fuel the fight back today. They helped to educate also. Hopefully they mean that historians of the strike are talking to a much wider audience in future. Any more? No. <coughs> Right. Okay, it. thank you very much, Ian. That's the words of Mike Simon, who's the executive uh, producer of the film. Um, fortunately, he couldn't be with us tonight, but he hoped, obviously, that he could. But in the of that, we have these words. Uh, what we can do now uh, is to have a look at some, hopefully, uh, some extracts uh, from the film. And he opened his purse, he opened his purse, and in his purse he had nine pence, nine pence, 
and he, 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 gave, he gave us five p piece and he get he said, I'm keeping keeping the fourpence for so I can get a cup of coffee. So I went in the bucket, I got an handful of coins out, I says, pal, take this from us, you'll need it more than we do. And I actually gave him, gave him an handful of change. You know, oh, look at that, started to fill up. A very emotional time, that, very emotional time. <coughs> and he says, keep the fight up. Thank you very much, keep the fight up. You know, it's just something that you remember, remember for the rest of your life. All well, time Tories were waiting for the time to strike. They'd already got it. It would it would a process, and people weren't just dropped in in 1984. And mm, it's a good idea to work on strike. It had developed the conditions that precipitated us into strike action. Right, were brought about uh, by Tory government compromising us at each stage testing them out, having test Ridley plan out on steel workers before us. We knew what was going to happen to us. We knew they were coming for us. And I remember sitting with my brother in pub, uh, near enough Christmas Eve, and him saying, well, because I think there'll be a strike, and there ain't be a strike. I says, uh, me, right, I I'm of opinion that they're going to force us to work on strike, and then come question, what will it be? Will it be a short or a long one? I says, if all the rest of the trade union movement comes out with us, based on experience in 1974, right, then it could be over in a fortnight, right? However, if we were, <laughs> if we're left on our own and we're isolated, right, it, it could be the longest strike in history. <laughs> I wish they'd never said them words, to be honest. We went to his house, and this will report the scab went back to work at Silverwood, we goes to his house and knocks on the door. I'm oh, so pleased to see us when he opens the door. Oh man, where have you fucking been? <laughs> and uh, come in and have a pot of tea, etc. And you see that all right, rest of the I've, been, I've not been down to picket line for ages. I'll tell you for why. My dad died. We couldn't get no money to bury him. What? We went ballistic. Right, so in space of, uh, I don't know, half an hour, we were down uh, to the union treasurer, give some money. Got it, money, it's not my money, no, it's our money, kids' money, etc. This lad, right, he's had to put his father away. He's been, I've been pulling his hair out because he couldn't get together 600 quid. No, oh, actually, the first night, this, this was a level of organisation, we were sent to a pit called Desford. And when we got there, we couldn't find it. There were no sat navs, nobody had maps. So we found ourselves in Leicester City Centre trying to find a pit somewhere in Leicestershire. And just by stopping people and asking them, we ended up at this pit called Desford Pit. When we got there, it had been closed months earlier. We, we'd almost started to light a fire there. We saw the car park the canteen and we thought we were already on strike. We thought this is brilliant. And it turns out some old bloke come to us and said, now now they shut this months ago lads. On the third night uh, we went to Ollerton, we were sent to Ollerton. And uh, there were roadblocks everywhere stopping us. They'd actually stopped one bus nine mile away from the pit and told <coughs> the driver that he'd be arrested if he went any further. And so all the miners on the bus got off the bus and walked nine miles to Ollerton. Later on in that night I found out that uh, a friend of mine who, who I was with on the picket line, who, who, a guy I used to go out for a drink with, a, a good friend of mine, a good friend of the family's in that young man, I think he was about 24, uh, he lost his life that night. He got hit, uh, he got hit in the chest with a, with a wall brick uh, and collapsed and uh, and died. Died after being hit by a by a wall brick uh, thrown by these guys. So very quickly, three days into the strike, one of your you know one of your best mates is just dead, and everything changes. It's a game changer. Everything's much more serious. 
my attitude to the police perhaps two years before the strike was that uh, perhaps they were doing a difficult job. Uh, most of them were okay. Uh, some rotten apples. Uh, my brother was a police a police uh, sergeant. Uh, my brother-in-law was a was a was a policeman, and seen bad people. They seemed all right. The police tried to speak to one minor and the people in the village of Fitzwilliam believed that they were singling this banner out for, for victimisation. Decided, look, we're not having this, that they might be able to do this in Nottingham, we might have a para, paramilitary style police force in Nottingham, but we certainly weren't going to take it in the outland of the strike, Yorkshire. So we decided to do something about it. We went in convoy to the nearest big police station, which was in Emsworth, and we actually uh, went outside and we barricaded the policemen in really. I remember there was the, the flagpole and we uh, took down one of the flag was there. We actually looked the Yorkshire Minor and we were throwing brick, bricks at the, uh, not me of course, you understand, <laughs> but we were throwing bricks at the, at the police station and uh, the police were actually barricading themselves in and they were totally, totally intimidated by it and I thought, you know, this, this shows you what, what we can actually do, you know. And uh, they, they, we got the NUM president at South Cable College to come down and he negotiated with the police that, uh, that, 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 that nothing would happen with the minor. And uh, we went on his way and we all dispersed home and then later on I heard that the police had waded in to the local uh, pub, the local working men's club, I believe, something like that. Fitzwilliam, Fitzwilliam Hotel, you've got it, Fitzwilliam Hotel. And uh, they started battering people arbitrarily, randomly. And uh, yeah, they really got stuck in, really, really did some damage. I remember the field was, it must have just been mown, it was like stubble, yeah. And I was talking to a woman from the SWP. Um, whose name's escaped me for the moment. Anyway, I was, I was chatting to her in the field. She was asking me about the strike, how I thought it was going and so on. And uh, I said, bloody hell, it's hot. You know, the sweat was pouring down me. And uh, Sheila McGregor. And then Sheila looked down. She said, by God, nobody, your trousers are on fire. I said, what? Oh, bloody hell. And me, me somebody had burnt a shield across the field and had set fire to the stumble. And I had caught on the bottom of my trousers. So as I'm doing this, packing my jeans to, to, to put the flames out, um, the lines just parted. And you know when the lines part, they're not parting because they're doing a circus act. You know what's happening, you know the horses are coming. So I just thought, oh bloody hell, I didn't even think about Sheila. Just turned and I just started to run and the horses came out and you could hear them galloping. You could feel the ground moving in the air and then, yeah. And I was like, you see him bolt going up that field. And I could hear behind me, as they were trying to hit me with the truncheon, but I, I was just keeping ahead of them. I got to the top of the field, and there was a wall about five foot tall. I just dove over the wall, and I went all the way down the railway embankment. And there was a cop on a horse at the top, looking at me, shaking his fist at me, and I'm shaking my fist at him from the bottom. And that was that. I could see people lying on the floor with blood coming out of them. Ran onto the road. The people in the houses opposite had put bricks on their walls for us to, to, to grab to throw at the piece. So we did, you know, we're throwing them at the piece. And it was a real messy, nasty, vicious battle going on. I saw somebody running up a fire escape and the horse was trying to clamber up the fire escape after him. It was madness, complete madness. And uh, there was this champ, there was this champ, yeah. honestly. It was, <laughs> it came up to us. There we are. So that's some extracts which weren't uh, shown uh, in the film but, uh, for various reasons, um, but it gives you a flavour for those that haven't seen the film. Uh, you know, the kind of stuff. Obviously, there's also archive footage uh, in there of uh, you know, various flashpoints of the strike uh, and so on, but the core of it is, uh, again, for those that have seen it will know, uh, is people that were involved in the strike talking about uh, what it was like and so on um, and I think it would be fair to say that the 
the overall kind of tenor at the end is that uh, I think there are shots of various people that you've seen there uh, on a demonstration against the cuts or uh, something like this now. Um, so I'd point out that you know it's not just uh, something for history, but something that's uh, a current uh, kind of thing. So um, thanks very again to Ian for reading out Mike Simon's uh, introduction. You've seen some extracts.